गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन नाउ वील बी स्टार्टिंग दिस पोस्टर पोडियम प्रेजेंटेशन सेशन द सेशन विल बी फ्रॉम एट ओ क्लॉक टू एट फिफ्टी फाइव सो वी हैव अबाउट फाइव मिनट्स पर प्रेजेंटर दे आर टेन प्रेजेंटर्स ऑन द लिस्ट सो आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट यू टू गिव योर प्रेजेंटेशन इन थ्री मिनट्स एंड वील हैव टू मिनट्स फॉर डिस्कशन एंड एट फाइव मिनट्स विल स्टॉप एंड द नेक्स्ट पर्सन विल स्टार्ट सो इफ यू डोंट फिनिश योर प्रेजेंटेशन टाइम यू लूज मार्क्स ऑन दैट I think uh, we'll ask Dr. Pushpanjali to start with the presentation. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. This interesting case is of a 48-year-old male who complained of sudden field defect in the right eye. His best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 618 and 66 in the left eye. On fundus examination, we found a large horseshoe tear in the superotemporal quadrant with macula of retinal detachment in the right eye and a lattice in the left eye. Patient was advised urgent buckling surgery in the right eye and barrage laser in the left eye. Patient next day underwent belt buckle surgery with subretinal fluid drainage and cryo in the right eye without tamponade. Post operatively, patient's retina was very well attached with best corrected visual acuity of 618. But on one week follow up, since the vis uh, visual acuity was unchanged, OCT was done, which revealed multiple shallow pockets of subretinal fluid subfovially and in the superotemporal quadrant with slight increase in choroidal thickness compared to the fellow eye. Patient was advised observation and to continue post operative eye drops. On one month follow up funda showed a clear non pigmented demarcation line in the superotemporal quadrant corresponding to area of retachment with hypopigmented lesions with surrounding hyperpigmentation corresponding to subretinal fluid pockets on oct this appearance that is a characteristic pattern of numular hypopigmentation surrounded by hyperpigmentation gave a giraffe or leopard spot pattern OCT also demonstrated a similar findings without intrinsic changes to the overlying retina that is of multiple PEDs there were hyperreflective dots also in the underlying retina corresponding to shed photoreceptor outer segments on follow up OCTs there was decrease in subretinal fluid but accentuated fundus lesions in a giraffe or leopard spot pattern and on OCT angiography the dark spots or areas suggest of choroidal ischemia were seen they were further enhanced on fundus autofluorescence at 10 month follow up the lesion had significantly reduced the pattern has also disappeared and uh, pockets had reduced on oct only a single subfovial pocket was seen the visual acuity was unchanged to 618 moving to the discussion part the pockets of sub retained subretinal fluid were first described by loops and grand in 1980 it is a common condition and the uh, incidence has been reported to be found to be 0 to 94% it can develop several days to weeks after con complete retinal reattachment surgery especially buckling plus minus cryo several pathological conditions have been described on fundus photography and fluorescein angiography showing leopard or uh, giraffe spot pattern it has been hypothesized that a breakdown of blood retinal bar barrier secondary to cryo and episcleral surgery leads to excessive deposit of proteins in subretinal fluid and formation of blebs uh, we can differentiate them from csr and vkh by fluorescein angiography uh, in which csr and vkh will show leakage this uh, patch this leopard spot pattern has similarities to leopard spot chorea retinopathy and could be categorized as a group of entities causing pachychoroid pigment retinopathy and rp involvement in secondary to choroidal involvement thus edi oct is confirmatory this patchwork of re pattern refers to the fact that anatomical recovery across rp is not uniform and some areas may lag behind others leading uh, forming a close photoreceptor rp dysfunction causes of persistent srf uh, can be type of surgery use of cryotherapy which leads to breakdown of blood retinal barrier incomplete drainage it has been found that air injection to avoid srf post operatively especially in long standing rds with superior breaks can uh, avoid this persistent srf after surgery the effect on vision is controversial some uh, researchers say that srf may not affect final bcva and anatomical retinal reattachment but many have claimed that it de usually delays visual acuity recovery so to conclude usually these patterns are usually self resolving they resolve spontaneously at one year so a long term follow up of our patient is also awaited to treat or not to treat has always been the hamlet's dilemma since no definitive therapy has been pointed out 
post via surgery serial ocd evaluation to diagnose monitor and knowledge of this condition post uh, vr surgery helps the clinician in uh, uh, a better addressing patient's expectations of visual recu recovery thank you for your patient listening uh, so so most likely you would not be treating these conditions. Yes, but if you get a patient who is referred and you have not seen him before, yes, then uh, would you advise certain specific tests to confirm whether it's a post-op uh, condition or it's a additional infirmary? Because six months or 10 months down the line, the patient may come yes, ha may have an additional inflammatory condition. So what is your, with this study, what do you feel that is a confirmatory sign? Fluorescein angiography can definitely help, sir. Mm. So I think fluorescein should be done in most of these cases. And in this yeah. case, it was not done, right? Oh, no, sir. We did OCT angiography. And since it was our patient and we had done surgery and uh, the we knew that for pre-operative and post-operative fundus appearance. So OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much. Now we'll have the uh, next speaker is Dr. Mahindra Kar. <coughs> and he'll be talking to us on results of sutureless vitrectomy for symptomatic floaters in pseudophagic eyes. Dr. Anirudh, please. Yes. Good morning, everybody. So here we'll be discussing about sutureless vitrectomy for symptomatic floaters. So floaters are, in fact, one of the most common presenting symptoms in our OPD, and patients are really irritated with them. So persistent and symptomatic floaters for long, long time should ideally be treated. Yeah, here we study the safety and efficacy of sutureless sparse plana vitrectomy for symptomatic floaters in pseudophagic eyes. In this long term, Symptomatic patients were included who had symptoms for at least two years. Informed consent and alternative treatment options were discussed. They had symptomatic floaters which caused detrimental impairment of their daily functional activities and the quality of life was severely impaired. So most patients were examined on multiple visits. Surgical intervention was avoided initially. Patient had a lot of quality of life issues and then the risk of pars plana vitrectomy was discussed and then only intervention was decided. The patients having significant retinal abnormalities including epiretinal membrane, retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage were excluded from the study. A core vitrectomy was performed. The vitreous was removed up to the vitreous base with proper shaving. A PVD in those cases where there was none was induced and extensive search for retinal breaks were conducted. Results were up followed up to 18 months on an average. Uh, the demographic showed 63 years of mean age, 48% were males. Etiology, most of them were PVD, 60% and asteroid hyalosis. So the outcome showed that the visual acuity improved from 618 to 69. 80% of the patients completed the questionnaire. Of that, 96.5% were satisfied and almost 85% said that it was a major success. A uh, pre-existing PVD was exist present in mo majority of the patients. In those whom it was not present, that is 6, uh, 17%, it was induced, but none of them had developed a retinal tear. However, an hydrogenic retinal tear was noticed in an eye in whom it was already documented as PVD. The post-op complications, none were major, major uh, severe complications like uh, no, ha no patient had retinal detachment or end of, but minor complications, cystoid macular edema was present in one eye and vitreous haze was present in two eyes. So sutureless pars plana vitrectomy, unlike the previous 20 gauge vitrectomy is definitely better. It decreases the surgically induced trauma, the operative time and post-op inflammation and helps in rapid recovery. Therefore there is a significant improvement in visual acuity and patient satisfaction, especially in those patients who had severe quality of life issues preoperatively. There is a low complication rate, hydrogenic retinal tear rate is also comparable with other indications for vitrectomy and no difference in PVD induction or no PVD induction is seen. The limitations of this study is that it is a retrospective study, there can be a selection bias, there is a limited patient population difficulty and the patients underwent survey few months after the uh, study. 
so high patient satisfaction was found active lifestyle and quality of life improved and vitreo retinal specialist as a vitreo retinal specialist we should increasingly be sensitive to patient subjective impairment and visual complaints and be increasingly willing to offer potential treatment options like sutureless vitrectomy to alleviate their symptoms thank you good presentation uh, have you compared your uh, results with uh, the uh, yag laser for uh, vitreous floaters uh, no, we here we have not compared the results with other modalities of uh, treatment. Like Do you YAG. have any experience? Uh, no, with YAG, uh, Hylard for vitreous floaters. Floaters, no. because that's been promoted and there are many presentations now where they claim yeah. that it's as good. There are some people who are only practicing as vitreous floater treatment people. But uh, I think uh, the message here is that uh, the vitrectomy is fairly safe. And in, if you take the proper precautions, as he said specifically, that you have to watch, watch for breaks. If you do that, I think it's a fairly good procedure and your patients seem to be quite satisfied. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Now the next presenter, yeah, you are the judge, you got the, yeah, you got it, right? yeah. The next you can do that one and make this announcement. So our uh, uh, next presenter is Dr. Rupa, she's there. If she's not there, we'll skip the. Now we have Dr. Anjali Rana. Now, Dr. Anjali Rana will be presenting iron deficiency anemia as predisposing factor for recurrent VKH syndrome. Um, good morning, one and all present here. Today I'll be presenting on iron deficiency anemia as a predisposing factor for recurrent VKH disease. I'm Dr. Anjali Rana, junior resident from Department of Ophthalmology in Srishikesh, and my co-author is my teacher, Dr. Raman yeah, Samantha, and my colleague, Dr. Nisha. So VKH involves a spectrum of diseases involving ocular, auditory, cutaneous, and neurological features. <coughs> the typical presentation being bilateral uveitis, exudative RD, with hyperemic and edematous disc. There has been uh, three types of or forms of VKH that has been described. One is the complete form, which involves ocular with two or more extraocular features. Incomplete having typical ocular involvement, with either neurological, auditory, or cutaneous features, whereas probable form involves only the ocular features without any systemic involvement. So I present here a 29-year-old female who presented to our OPD with chief complaint of sudden diminution of vision for both eyes for three days, which was not associated with any redness, pain, trauma, or any systemic complaint, or any history of previous episodes in the past. So on ocular examination, as you can see, the best corrected visual acuity in right eye was 6 by 24, and in left eye it was 6 by 60. In the fundus photo, as it can be seen, that there is bilateral disc hyperemia with a swelling of optic disc, which can be seen in right more than left. And there are multiple pockets of subretinal fluid. Also in the autofluorescence picture, you can see that there is uh, macular hyperautofluorescence along with focal areas of hypoautofluorescence at the areas of serious detachment. We did a fundus fluorescein angiography of the patient and we found out in right eye, you can see there is persistence of uh, multiple hypofluorescent lesions. And in left eye, as you can see, uh, there is, uh, in late stages, there is pooling of dye in the areas of neurosensory detachment along with the disc staining. The OCT of the patient in the, pres uh, in the initial visits, you can see there is neurosensory detachment, which is more in the left eye. So after excluding all the differentials, we made a diagnosis of probable VKH. Uh, so we started the patient on IV methyl bread at the dose of one gram per day for five days, followed by oral corticosteroids at the dose of 80 mg per day. So as you can see, as the days progress, the patient uh, noted, matlab, we noted some gradual progression and matlab, resolution of the symptoms. And uh, thereafter, the tapering was done after one week at after one week of oral steroids at the rate of 5 mg per week. But at 10 weeks, on maintenance dose of the oral uh, steroids, we found there was a recurrence of the subretinal fluid pockets, which can be seen in the fundus photo of the right eye. Also, it can, it, uh, these pockets are seen in the OCT as well. So we underwent, we uh, underwent a systemic, uh, as the patient to undergo a systemic evaluation, we found that she had severe iron deficiency anemia. So we referred her to a physician who started on ferric carboxymaltose, which was given both IV stat and oral doses. And we continued it along with the maintenance dose of oral steroids. So after two weeks, we noted a good resolution in both the uh, eyes and the best collective visual acuity improved to six by nine in both the eyes. Um, so there are some of the causes, as you can see, recurrence, which is the poor initial, it can be called due to presenting visual acuity, a higher anterior chamber reaction, a more extraocular manifestation, incomplete storage dose and duration, rapid tapering, 
and poor compliance of the patient. So this case highlights the need of additional systemic in, uh, evaluations in a patients who despite adequate treatment and being compliant, they still recur. Thank you. Do you have any uh, re reference of uh, this anemia being uh, recorded as an association with weak age? There is no uh, record. Yes, sir, I did not found it. As per our <coughs> research, we didn't found it. Because I think uh, we, this can be a common, because uh, an anemia in uh, females of that age group is not uncommon in India. But nevertheless, it's a good idea to investigate them, and especially because we are going to put them on steroids and you're going to put them on ions, so they'll develop a lot of gastric symptoms also. So you have to be careful. Okay. I think you have to look after more, and if we have definite association, you can present a bigger uh, study with more number of patients. Thank you. But what, so what is your hypothesis? Yes, yes. Like how does anemia cause a recurrence? Why do you think so? Sir, it was like ki, uh, a concomitant factor along Chindi with ki, like in anemic retinopathy, there is a hypothesis that anemia causes status, uh, stasis of the blood. Uh, with increasing the vascular permeability so being a uh, right. predisposing matlab, it, she was already weak age so along anemia like exaggerated it and just caused it a bit earlier okay thank you uh, you can announce the next speaker then you can talk uh, dr akshat kothari is here now uh, dr shrey maheshwari uh, he'll present to us uh, more than meets the eye a case of bilateral azure. Uh, uh, the iron deficiency anemia, any anemia for that matter, uh, all inflammations, you know, uh, and all vascular retinopathies, all of these, there is an uh, uh, inflammatory element which gets worsened by any kind of ischemia. So the importance of uh, finding out about anemia in all these cases. Please start. <coughs> Three minutes presentation, two minute discussion. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Shrey Maheshwari, and I will be uh, presenting on acute zonal occult uh, outer retinopathy. Uh, we had a patient who was a 30-year-old male who came with the complaints of black spots in the vision in both eye. Uh, he had the complaint uh, in right eye for last one week and left eye for la uh, last two months. Uh, on ocular examination, we found that uh, his best corrected visual equity was uh, six, six parts in right eye and six by six in left eye. Uh, the anterior segment, uh, everything was normal. And he also gave a past history. Uh, his paper showed us that he was diagnosed elsewhere as a glaucoma suspect. Uh, for both the eyes and was diagnosed as a CSR and then resolved CSR for the left eye. On fundus examination uh, and the fundus autofluorescence, uh, as you can see in the picture, we found uh, multiple white dots uh, and a hyperfluorescent uh, area uh, in the peripapillary region and around the macula uh, in both the eyes. We further did the OCT scan and uh, on that we found that there was disruption of the ISOS junction and ellipsoid uh, uh, layer uh, in both the right eye and the left eye and on doing the FFA and uh, ICGA uh, we uh, found the most diagnostic sign for the azu that is the trizonal pattern as you can see in the late phases that we can uh, see a, a, a hypofluorescent area and uh, then uh, hyposinescent area and then the uh, speckled hypofluorescence and hyposinescence and the outer ring of the hyperfluorescence. Uh, uh, after that, we asked the patient to also undergo a field test and we found the scotomas in both eye, right eye and the left eye. And then we started the patient on the topical steroids, oral steroids, we started uh, in the tapering dose with 40 mg, uh, starting him on with 40 mg. Along with that, uh, suspecting if a viral etiology, uh, then we also started him on uh, trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole uh, tablet and as the patient uh, continued uh, the treatment and we did the eventual uh, field we found that the scotomas started resolving and in the final follow-up that was on uh, 17th of September six months after the initial presentation the scotomas were uh, almost completely resolved uh, especially in the left eye so coming to the discussion part uh, azure complex is considered to be the part of the white dot uh, syndrome 
and it is more of an exclusion uh, diagnostics. The white dot syndrome includes uh, birdshot chorioretinopathy, uh, acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy, punctate inner choroidopathy, multiple evanescent white dot syndromes. So to diagnose an azure uh, patient, it is important that we uh, keep in mind these fundus pictures because it's more of an exclusion diagnosis. So as you can see in the first picture, it's a birdshot uh, chorioretinopathy and uh, it's a rare unknown etiology, central photopsia, progressive scotoma and blurring of vision are the major symptoms. It's a diagnosis of exclusion and diagnostic criteria include demarcating line of progression, trizonal pattern and zonal progression. ERG is one of the important uh, uh, the modes of uh, identification of Azure as it shows 30 hertz flicker response. And so this is the classical picture that we normally see in the autofluorescence in Azure with the three trizonal pattern and three different zones. Uh, this is again the OCT with ISOS disruptions. And ERG, uh, when we do, so we, uh, for the dark adapted and light adapted thing, 30 hertz flicker is the important, uh, 30 hertz flicker gets decreased and that is the most important criteria in ERG for Azure. <coughs> so treatment is steroids. There is uh, papers which have even talked about intravital ozodics when oral steroid, uh, systemic steroids and topical steroids didn't work. So they, they use the intravital ozodics and that worked very well in reducing the scotomas. So the conclusion is a multimodal imaging plays a key diagnosis in uh, such uh, uh, diseases. And we should be more careful uh, with the uh, diagnosis when it comes to scotomas and every field effect should not be related to glaucoma and we should consider other etiologies and pathologies also. Thank you. Good presentation. Thank you, sir. Good presentation. Uh, you in, in just you are, when you are talking, you said you also studied the patient on uh, trimethoprim antibiotics, uh, suspecting viral etiology. So why did you have that? So you wanted to say, you said viral etiology and an antibiotic combination. So anti uh, we started him on antibiotics. Uh, sorry for viral etiology. Yeah, fine. So because yes, uh, if yes, viral, you would start some other yes, drug, sir. right? Yes, sir. Any other questions, sir? So the, this trizonal pattern is seen on OCT, OCT also. Yeah. So did you find it on, uh, on uh, the scans? Like no, sir. In OCT, we did not uh, find that, sir. Only in the fundus autofluorescence and uh, when we did the angiography, then we found this uh, trizonal pattern. On OCT, we just found the ISOS was uh, disrupted, major, sir. Yeah, and that uh, correlated with the areas of the scotomas which presented on the field. Exactly. The unfast mode, did you check that hey, yeah. for the Yes, sir, we, we uh, checked that, but we did not uh, Excellent. Find, uh, find the... Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Mahak Garg. She'll talk to us about intravitreal triamcinolone versus ozodex in retinal vein occlusion in treatment naive patients. And the greatest sources of the visual loss are macular edema, macular ischemia, and the sequelae of neovascularization. Uh, we compared the efficacy and side effects of intravitreal triamcin alone with intravitreal dexamethasone implant, that is Ozodex, in patients of macular edema secondary to retinal vein occlusion. Uh, Preoperatively, best corrected visual acuity was noted, intraocular pressure was noted, and central macular thickness was measured by OCT. And then the patients, uh, after evaluation, received either intravitreal triamcinolone or ozodex. Uh, patients with uh, glaucoma or iris neovascularization, hazy media, or active ocular in uh, infections were excluded. On comparing the uh, logmar best corrected visual acuity, we noted a statistically significant difference between the pre-operative vision and the post-operative vision, uh, but there was no statistically difference when we compared between the two groups. Uh, comparing the central macular thickness between the Ozodex and IVTA group, uh, there was statistically significant decrease in the central macular thickness between in the two groups, but on comparing between the two groups, there was no statistically significant difference. Uh, this is the OCT image showing the preoperative uh, 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 macular edema and, the, and at the six months in the Ozodex group. On comparing the intraocular pressure between the Ozodex and IVTA group, there was a statistically significant increase in uh, 
the IOP in both the groups, but it was statistically higher in the uh, IVTA group as compared to the OZX group. But it was well controlled with anti-glaucoma medications. So both IVTA and OZX are effective in improving the mean visual acuity in cases of retinal vein occlusion. And uh, there is a 75% efficacy in the OZX group and we found a 60% efficacy in the IVTA group. Uh, the rise in intraocular pressure was seen in both the groups but was higher in the IVTA group and hence required a higher number of intervention in terms of anti-glaucoma medications. Uh, none of the patients uh, underwent any surgery. Cataract formation was seen in only one patient in the IVTA group and none in the OZX group. That could be due to the smaller sample size and a shorter follow-up period. So on concluding this, the intravitreal steroids are an effective treatment modality in improving visual acuity and reducing macular edema in cases of retinal vein occlusion. Uh, the only concern was the rise in intraocular pressure, which was well managed with anti-glaucoma medications. Thank you. Uh, subsequently, have you tried uh, uh, at your institution about uh, supracoroidal injection of tramsin alone? Uh, no, sir. So we can't what was the longest follow-up period in this study? 12 months. 12 months. 12 months. So, and how many of the patients needed a repeat um, uh, IVTA or OZX? In the OZX group, there were three patients who needed repeat injection. And one patient uh, received, uh, every five monthly, he received an injection of OZX. OZX. Uh, but so tramsinolol did tram not need to be? Also, patients received uh, repeat injections and they needed it at uh, around three months. And was there any significant difference between the repeat uh, procedures between the two groups? Uh, there was no significant difference. Um, only the duration was there, ma'am, around three months. Ke baad usme lagana pada tha, and after around five months, all the text was repeated. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Next presentation. Uh, I mean, next page. Okay, so the next presentation is going to be uh, by uh, Dr. Priyanka Parihar and the topic is clinical presentation of traumatic retinal detachment at tertiary eye care center. She's not Dr. There? Priyanka? Not there. Next. Okay, okay so the next presentation is going to be from Dr. Saeed Hussain, spontaneous supracoroidal hemorrhage in a two years old child with clotting factor deficiency and seizures. Dr. Rupa there? Has Dr. Rupa reported? Yeah, please. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we present a rare case of bilateral spontaneous suprachoroidal hemorrhage in a two-year-old child with clotting factor deficiency and seizures. So, uh, so suprachoroidal hemorrhage is a rare but potentially vision-threatening pathology. It occurs when blood from the, uh, usually the short but also sometimes the long severe arteries fills within the space between the choroid and the sclera. It can be seen in cases of coagulation disorders as a spontaneous event, but that is extremely rare. Here, we present a case of a two-year-old boy diagnosed to have deficient factor eight, and uh, factor five and eight uh, with supercoral hemorrhage bilaterally. So he, uh, he was initially admitted uh, in the ICU of the pediatric department to rule out the presence of retinal hemorrhages because he had rashes all over his body and <coughs> other uh, deficiency, uh, other manifestations of the factor deficiencies. Uh, he was brought <coughs> with multiple bruises, fever, and altered sensorium with seizure history six months back, uh, incomplete immunization, and a uh, birth history of consanguinity. Uh, the vision extraocular movements could not be assessed. Uh, the child was in extreme pain and altered sensorium. Uh, the anterior segment was within normal limits. On dilated fundus examination, on the first day of the ICU admission itself, the child had bilateral supracoroidal hemorrhages, uh, which were uh, seen as dark mounds. And this was present along with mild vitreous hemorrhage in the initial days. Now, uh, the child was already under intensive uh, care and was given uh, blood transfusions as well as fluids. On serial examinations, the hemorrhage progressed to dense vitreous hemorrhage both the eyes. And as the patient was not systematically stable, continued obse observation along with uh, 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 bilateral B scans were done. The, uh, the pediatrician did not uh, advise steroid or uh, IOP reduction drugs at, at this time. Over the course of the month, uh, the uh, repeated B scans showed retinal detachment of the left eye, 
while uh, right I only had mild vitreous hemorrhage, uh, dense vitreous hemorrhage which was resolving. Uh, so this was the profile on CT scan of the brain's intracerebral hemorrhage. CSF profile was normal, clotting factor deficiency on repeated testing came to be fa factor 5 and 8. Again, initially because of the blood transfusions, this was not detected. Uh, so over a period of two weeks, we got the diagnosis. Uh, the vitreous hemorrhage along with the RD was uh, noted in the B scan image. So this was the B scan image when the <coughs> RD was noted. The mobile vitreous echoes in the right eye with complete mobile vitreous detachment with no evidence of RD, but the left eye showed bullous fixed retinal detachments. And as compared to the previous scans, there was a reduction in VH with the development of left eye retinal detachment. So management, uh, the ICU uh, pediatricians had already given FFP as well as trans uh, the blood transfusions. The patient was managed conservatively for the right eye and underwent a surgery for the retinal detachment of the left eye after explaining the guarded visual prognosis. Uh, sadly, due to the logistic issues, uh, the availability as of the backup as well as the uh, factor factors for the blood products, the surgery was delayed and uh, did not have a good prognosis even after a silicone in infusion. Uh, it is an extremely rare event, risk factors being Vagulopathy, systemic hypertension, increasing age, uh, decompensate late liver disease, AFAKIA, glaucoma. Uh, but in this set of patients, it has not been uh, reported. It's almost never been reported spontaneously. Only one case report that we could find was in a 13-year-old with idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Even that patient had a very poor prognosis. Uh, because of this, uh, we had to explain the parents of the grave future complications. It is, it is a rare event, but... Uh, we could not do much in this case. What was the time duration between presentation and actual surgical intervention? Two months. Man. Two months. Okay. So do you think this was a regmatogenous RD or was there a hemorrhagic rectal detachment? Because ultrasound shows a lot of echoes behind the retina. Uh, probably, sir, it was a combined mechanism because uh, the, the dense vitreous hemorrhage with the slow resolving, it has been uh, proposed that it causes breaks as well as the fractional component and the vitreous image never resolved completely. Even in, in the better eye, it was always still a component remaining. Did, was there any relation to the seizures he had, any injury during seizures? Not that the parents, uh, or not that we could elicit on history. Sir. Otherwise you start thinking of something like a battered baby also. Exactly. No? Yes, yes, we definitely ruled that out. Just like we involved the uh, psychiatrist also from uh, our hospital as well as the pediatrician. But the parents were not, uh, they were not aware of the condition itself. The, it was more of neglect rather than battered. Fine, thank you. Thank you. Only the seizures only must mm. The last presenter is Dr. Samira Nayak. <laughs> Just checking while she's ready. Uh, is Dr. Rupa there? Ru Rupa Appel, Dr. Akshat Kothari. And Dr. Kalpana, no, Priyanka Parihar. No. Please go. <coughs> I think the rare event will be finishing the session faster. We did a study titled Site Threatening Intraocular Infection in COVID 19 Patients in India. It was conducted in LB Prashad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, 
and Vijayawada between April 2020 to January 2021. Laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19 who presented to us for end of salmitis management was included in this study. Data included complete demography, systemic comorbidities, detail of COVID care, their biochemistry as well as microbiology. A comprehensive eye examination was done for each patient. Endophthalmitis was managed as per institute protocol. We included 33 eyes of 24 patients. Cases of endogenous endophthalmitis coincided well with the COVID wave in both the states. Majority had systemic comorbidities. Mean interval of COVID-19 system, systemic symptoms to ophthalmic symptom was 15 days. Majority had anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutrophilia and lymphopenia and raised inflammatory biomarkers. All had received broad spectrum antibiotic and majority had re received systemic corticosteroid. Out of 14, out of uh, uh, 1914 had microbiologically positive vitreous sample of which 11 were fungi, 2 bacteria and 1 virus. 11 of 21 had some systemic focus of infection such as candidemia, bacteremia, aspergillus, mucormycosis, etc. Ocular treatment included vitreous biopsy, vitrectomy, intraocular antibiotic, antifungal, and when retina detachment was detected, silicon oil injection was done. Five patients expired due to COVID-19 related complications. At the last follow-up, only 40% had visual acuity better than 2400. This is a 58-year gentleman who presented to us with pre-retinal exudate and the species was identified to be Candida tropicalis. This is another gentleman, 59 year, who presented with retina detachment and choroidal thickening. The species was identified to be Fusarium equiseti. 65 year gentleman, he presented with bilateral vitreous abscess and the microscopy revealed shifted fungal filaments and the species was identified to be Aspergillus flavus. So, Endophthalmitis is a rare but not uncommon occurrence in patients with uh, COVID-19. It is associated with high mortality and blindness. Ocular infection is related with as comorbidities, hospitalization, ICU admission. Fungus is the commonest organism. Thank you. What was the total Thank number you. of eyes and uh, how many were culture positive? So we included 33 IS of 24 subjects and uh, uh, out of 19 vitreous biopsy, 14 uh, had some microbiological uh, in, uh, mic you know, it, it was uh, microbiologically positive either in smear or culture, out of which 11 were fungi, 2 were bac bacterial and 1 virus. and. Uh, out of uh, 21, 11 had some uh, systemic focus of infection. Five had candidemia, three had bacteremia, one had aspergillus in renal biopsy and paranasal sinus biopsy, and one had mycormycosis in paranasal sinuses. So five patients did not undergo vitreous biopsy? Yes, and five patients actually uh, expired due to COVID-19 uh, related complications. They were very fragile, unstable, and we could not do any surgical procedure for them. Any intravitreal antibiotics were tried? Uh, yes, intraocular antibiotic was given uh, in the OPD. But that didn't work in most cases? No. Patient actually expired uh, after a few days. So most came with a situation that they needed surgery? Yes. Early surgery is preferred in this type of cases, otherwise uh, it progresses very first uh, leading to vitreous abscesses and uh, those who presented very late, uh, they after surgery also uh, macular scar and dragging pulling of uh, retina that we found even with silicon oil injection.
any more question only 40 percent had visual acuity better than 2400 so what's your recommendation so uh, so we recommend uh, routine uh, eye examination uh, for uh, patients particularly those who are admitted in icu and all of these patients presented after discharge from an icu 12 weeks within 12 weeks of discharge from the hospital but none of them were diagnosed during the ICU stay? No. None of them had undergone any eye examination during ICU stay? No. Then? Okay. I think that's very important because I also had, I think we had presented this case report in IGO mm -hmm. where we have candida infection. Uh, he had multiple candida spots but no vitreous involvement mm -hmm. and responded to intravitreal uh, anti-fungal. Uh, but again, same story that he was admitted when underwent treatment almost for a month in the hospital and no eye examination. So I think that's a message we have to uh, we take. We need to sensitize uh, the physicians and intensivists uh, about the need for ocular uh, examination and documentation. So there your mobile uh, fundus photography would be extremely useful. And uh, second thing is, uh, you know, a lot of these were all fungal. So some like candida would be either related to the canalization or just a basic depressed immunity. Whereas the others like aspergillus and mucormycosis might often be related to reusage of the nasal cannulas, which are, uh, uh, you know, for uh, oxygen or the high pressured oxygens, etc. So we need to sensitize the nurses and the staff that uh, once you've used it on a patient, please chuck it at, and they have to be sensitized about cleaning those tubings also, the source from where the oxygen comes in. Yeah, we in our uh, series we studied uh, um, only two patients had level three and ICU care, and rest had received care in makeshift hospital or in uh, level one or two ICU. So definitely, ICU protocol is very important uh, to prevent uh, this type of uh, fungal infection. And they were the first wave or the second wave? Or this is the first wave, so yeah. only one mycormycosis we saw yeah. that time. So in right. second wave, did you get more? Yes, and uh, the varieties are actually different. So it presented uh, uh, one uh, is uh, very multiple retinochoroditis at the periphery. That is the first presentation. Second is uh, focal uh, retinochoroditis with uh, localized vitritis. The third one is diffuse uh, kind of uh, vitritis and uh, retinochoroditis and uh, the fourth one is actually a very late stage uh, thiasis and uh, you know those who uh, did not receive any kind of treatment thank you thank you very good presentation. keep up the good work <laughs> thank you this is a last call for people who have not reported dr rupa no. Then Dr. Akshat Kothari. And uh, who else? Dr. Uh, Kal okay. Priyanka Parihar. Okay, if they are not there, so then I think we will conclude our session and hand over the session uh, in time. As Indigo says, we are in time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the members on the dais. Thanks to the presenters. And thank you very much to the audience and the audiovisual team. Okay. 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 Yeah, okay. You collect. You can, you can collect everything. Yeah. Your sign. 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 Yes. Sign. 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 I started with one. <laughs> he joined me. The pelle one.
Thank you.